Black parents, you fight so hard to get your kids into the greatest schools that you can imagine possible. And oftentimes those greatest schools that you can imagine are the ones that are not in the so-called hood. Those are the schools that are either in the suburbs or they're private schools or they're selective enrollment schools. These are schools where you think that you could put your kids into the safe harbor of uh, high achieving students, a sea of high achieving, uh, achieving students and high academic performance. So these look like it's the promised land. But is it really? We're going to talk about it today on today's Freedom Friday show. Well, welcome to another episode of Freedom Friday. Today is Friday, of course, and uh, we learn in peace, but sometimes we choose violence. I'm back with my brother, <laughs> uh, Sharif el Mehdi. He's laughing because uh, I choose violence at least three times a day. This will be my first one today. Uh, it's still and, and, early. It's still early. <laughs> it's still early. I got two more times. Uh, Joy Jones, morning to you too. I see you have just come in. We got three, four people jumping in. Like, share the show, send it out to your friends and family, because we're going to get into it today, talking about uh, these schools that we think are the safe harbor for our kids. Sometimes that they're not, when I say these schools, I mean selective schools, schools that are outside of the hood or schools that are either, you know, private or uh, some sort of special special school like magnets or just whatever we think is the shining school on the hill where we could put our kids and it's going to all go well. Sometimes that's not the case. Good morning, uh, Vicky Redmond. See you there. Coming in. Sharif, brother, how are you doing this morning? Doing well, man. Great to be here. Happy Friday. Friday's always special, special days. And um, yeah, looking forward to the show and this weekend. Well, you know, apropos to the show, you and I just were uh, in Indianapolis. So people, uh, to the folks of Indy, thank you so much for hosting us. Nap so well. Town, so, stand Nap up. Town. Yeah, I didn't even know what Nap Town was, but there we were uh, in Indy, and we did a show at the uh, um, the Madam C.J. Walker uh, Theater, which was amazing. It was a yeah, beautiful, yeah. beautiful theater. We were well hosted, well received. Uh, we also did a visit. People can't see here. Believe Circle City Charter School. We went and visited this. Uh, we visited a couple of schools, but I want to talk about belief specifically. Number one, because I've talked so long about the belief gap and closing the belief gap is the first gap we need to close. We talk about all kinds of other gaps, you know, like the the achievement gap or the opportunity gap or the wealth gap and blah, 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 all those, whatever. That's great. But the belief gap uh, is to me the most pernicious gap that affects our young people, which is the difference between what they're capable of doing and what the adults in their lives think that they're capable of doing. And there's a big gap between those two things. At Believe Charter School in Circle City, or Believe Circle City Charter School, I should say, uh, it was just obvious to me that this was a small, intimate environment where the kids felt cared for, everybody knew their names, um, the school leader was strong, effective, motherly, uh, caring, nurturing. Um, these kids had people checking in on them all the time to see how are you doing, not just in school, but outside of school too. Um, we met with a total of five students uh, that we got to speak one-on-one -on -one with, and uh, it was amazing. It was it was just yeah. I felt great about it. How'd you feel, Shreve? Man, I love I loved and, it. And I, you know what? I think that's my favorite part. You know, sometimes it's hard going in other people's school now that I don't have one. You know, I'm just like, mm -hmm. oh, I miss it so much. You know, but I, I was able to like, you know, manage my emotions uh while I was there and just really be in the moment, you know. Um, and I just enjoyed speaking to to them and you know, hearing these young men, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, compare their experiences to that of their peers um compare their experiences at believe compared to where they may have been um and you know my biggest takeaway was just like this is how you intentionally build a school community mm -hmm. right where there's mm -hmm. trust um and there's challenge right like it's not just oh you're going to be here you're going to be safe and comfortable you're going to be safe and brave we're going to challenge you you're going to take risks we're going to be here to support you and we're accountable for your success mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that's the adults feel like, no, I, I'm actually responsible to, you know, for outcomes. I am going to push and challenge myself and I'm going to push and challenge you. But the students responding and also saying, yeah, but I also have ownership. I have agency, right? Like that was three of their pillars was agency, acceleration and autonomy. 
Look at you remembering all the pillars of the AAA, school. Triple A, baby, triple A. Look at you. <laughs> Look at you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I think, yeah. you know, and it, it wasn't just something plastered on the wall because a whole lot of people have beautiful words and beautiful websites mm -hmm. and beautiful posters. But I could hear that even before I saw it on the wall through our conversations with the with these young men. They, uh, they had nothing but uh, realistic, real talk for us about how they had maybe had some stumbles before they came to the school. They experienced some things at home. The pandemic has, you know, kind of just generally depressed a lot of our kids in some ways. But to know that school was a place where uh, they would be nurtured and cared for made it easier for them to see it as a place to come. They wanted to be there. They wanted to be around. This was family to them. And I love it. That's the feeling we should have in all of our schools. It's apropos for our, our subject today. So it's a good transition into what we're talking about today. Um, before we jump in, though, Natalie Hester, uh, good to see you. Good morning. Elaine Wells, Sister Wells, thank you so much Wells, for sharing the show. Elaine. Sister Wells is sharing the, sh the show out this morning with multiple people, and we hope that they come in. Um, uh, and if you are here and stopping by, say, say good morning in the comments. Uh, and if you have any questions, thoughts or uh, things that you think would make the discussion better, drop it in the comments. We'll take a look at it. So uh, Sharif, I asked you, what did you think about we should talk about today? And you said, well, let's talk about this situation with selective schools. Um, and it's kind of a, you know, multi-pronged discussion because there's different pieces of it. So we have selective magnet schools. We have suburban schools. We have schools where it's just not easy to get in and it takes some effort for parents to get their kids there. And the idea is if you can get your kids there, their life will be better. Their outcomes will be better. Um, so parents go through all kinds of stuff to, to make it happen. They pay for more, they pay for a bigger mortgage. Uh, they move across town. Uh, they go through pretty rigorous uh, magnet school application processes or whatnot. Um, but it doesn't always end up to be the thing that they wanted it to be. You sent me multiple articles looked through them. Several of them are about black uh, people, black students talking about their experiences in these schools and mostly yes. white schools when they get there. Mm -hmm. And the experiences are kind of heartbreaking, you know, yeah. gut wrenching. So what about this topic to you resonates with you the most? And why, why do you want to talk about this as a topic? Yeah, I mean, I think there were a couple of things all happening at once that really made me uh, that. So it was on, on my uh, the front of my mind as I was thinking. So one, uh, Philadelphia uh, school district leaders are revamping the uh, magnet school application or acceptance process, uh, removing some of it from you know principals or leadership teams, managing it tightly and deciding who can come uh, to those schools. Um, and then I started thinking about Okay, that's cool. And also saw people's responses, you know, like, well, what about the kids who worked hard? But meaning that are, are you implying that, you know, black kids don't work hard? Because in, in these schools, in these selective public schools, there's a distinct difference between what the overall city uh, demographics are and what these magnet school demographics are. So in a place like Philadelphia, where the vast majority, you know, probably 70, 80 percent of the students are students of color. Um, when you get to these uh, magnet schools, it's the black and brown folks that are minority. And like, how does that happen just in these schools? But also, also think about neighborhood schools. So if we have however many um, you know, magnet schools and, and criteria based schools where you might have to do an interview. So people are like, oh, are you a right fit? You know what? You know, some of these schools start really young. And so elementary school kids, you may be penalized because you miss too many days, even though you can't get yourself to school. So whatever it is, you know, if your parent has multiple schedules or this or that, I, I know someone who who uh, couldn't get into the school. And David Hardy talks about this a lot. Their child couldn't get in, even though they had amazing everything else, but they missed six days of school or something crazy the year before. Mm -hmm. so like, mm -hmm. nope, that's what kept you out. But then I also thought about neighborhood schools, right? And so like, all right, these are places where, you know, they're like, oh yeah, we can take the so-called elite from that community, then but the neighborhood schools are not invested in. But the biggest thing that was just vexing me was uh, just, and this is like for all, whether it's private school or just any of these spaces that's, as you said, looked at as safe harbors, uh, what happens to, what's the black experience there? 
And it made me think of last year when there were a lot of folks, both at colleges, high schools, uh, youth were starting to talk about this is my experience at it. So if uh, Instagram was when I first saw it, it was like black at mainline or something or black on mainline. Um, and they were talking about mainline schools, which is one of the wealthiest places, not just in Pennsylvania, but around the country. You know, there's a string of private schools and, you know, uh, you know, there's some some black and brown students who get there and they're talking about their experiences. And it is just gut wrenching, as you said, to not only read it, but then to also to not be surprised. You know, I was thinking about that, like I'm not even surprised. And that hurt over on top of it. It's like compound gut wrenching. Yeah. And, you know, it's got to be even more gut wrenching for parents, if you oh, think yeah. about it, um, um, who spend so much time and effort and energy, money and resources and money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. to get their kids into schools that they think are going to be the place. And it's not. You get there. And this is the big trade off. I don't think we talk all the time about um, there are no silver bullets. You make trade offs. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are parents that want heavy academics because they know that academics that lead to college is a pathway for getting your kids to good in life. Like if you if your goal is to get your kid uh, into adulthood doing well, you want them to be around other kids that are on track to go to college and do something good in life. Okay, great. And they're like, it's less yeah. distractions, yeah. but they're looking at distractions in a narrow way, maybe, you know? What do you mean by that? Like, say more. So they're like, hey, you know what? Um, in the school, in my neighborhood school, there's, you know, uh, the, there's poor classroom management. The classroom is overcrowded. There's less resources. You know, students may may be disengaged. Hell, the staff may be disengaged from the students, which is usually the driver of all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so then they say, well, let me go and put you in this, you know, Tony private or suburban school. But then the distraction becomes the anti-blackness. That's hmm. the needle that just constantly gets, you know, it's mm -hmm, like an mm -hmm. intellectual gut punch every moment of, of that black young black child and children. Right. And so then and then we were thinking talking about right before the show, then there's so many students who say who are experiencing these, you know, this uh, anti blackness uh, distraction. And they say, I haven't shared this with my family because I know all the sacrifices that they made. So then we have children who are holding all of this, all of these experiences within and just trying to navigate. They don't want to let their family down. They know about all the sacrifices. They know how proud their family is of, you know, oh, my child is there. And, it's, you know, that's a great school. And it's a blah, 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 blah. And meanwhile, what what's what's that mm. child carrying? You know, um, and are they really reaching their full potential? Like it's in so many spaces that we just we'll never realize the full potential of our black children being actualized because mm. they're in school. Like that's, that's crazy. A, that's the goal too though, right? Yeah. That's, I mean, that's the thing that we want. So when you're saying so many of us aren't achieving that and it's like, but that's the it, that's the reason yeah. that we, we fight so hard. And the thing uh, that we may think that they're doing it because they may have like just great scores and they're there and they're participating yeah. in extracurricular and they're leaders and they're respected and, and you know what? That's still not their full potential because it's being limited because all of the just mm -hmm. internalized racism and oppression, mm -hmm. you know, that they are, you know, that they're experiencing. Which, you know, we're going to keep talking about this, but a lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people uh, they believe that. Go with the program. I mean, it's, you know, we have some of our own skin folk who are out here talking so often about you are not oppressed. You've never been oppressed. Yeah, uh, yeah. Microaggressions and safe spaces. That's just a bunch of snowflake stuff and all that mm -hmm. stuff, which to me basically is a level of self-hatred and hate hatred of black children that I just I think we need to examine where that comes from. Because meanwhile, you have other people who are like with their own children, with white children who are making sure that they try and create every safe space for their own children mm -hmm. to the point now where what we've said over many weeks now, <laughs> right, right, yeah. over many weeks now, I mean, uh, let me, for those of you who are listening, let me just let you in on a little story that Sharif and I were talking about today, because I'm collecting these stories. So there's a book called The New Kid, which is a book that examines the life. It, it's a funny and illustrative book about a black kid who's trying to fit in, uh, in, new, in a new school. And he's the new kid. And it's a black kid who's having, you know, some adventures fitting in type of thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. Award-winning author, award-winning book, got the Coretta Scott King Award, 
uh, author was invited to come and talk to students at uh, the KDISD Independent School District in Texas, and that now has been revoked. He cannot come, and the book has been uh, temporarily suspended and removed because one white mom, one white parent who had ran for school board before, who's among the national syndicate of uh, white moms who are fighting for a white nationalist agenda in public schools, she didn't like it. So she took it to the board. She started a change.org petition. The petition was so bad that it got removed from change.org for violating community guidelines. That's how like how obvious, uh, obviously racist some of these things are. And now that author's not coming. Those students aren't going to see it. And a book that examines the life of a black kid fitting into a new school that is considered comedic and and uh, and insightful uh, won't be in the hands of those students because of one black mother who didn't want her, one black child. And she said, this is what she said. Well, it doesn't really have CRT themes in it, but the kid experiences some bad experiences with white kids, and that might make my my white kids feel bad reading it. Yeah, but Diary of a Wimpy Kid, that, that's like, that's amazing, right? Like, you know, that <laughs> that experience is fine, but it's, it's like, it's Not crazy. One, and then, no. what, there's a Connecticut uh, legislator for him. And the thing about it, when people say this stuff, they know that they are in safe spaces to share right. this. Right. right. It's not like they're going to say it and people are going to be aghast. They're like, yeah, there will be a group that that not down with this. But there's a whole lot of folks. My tribe is going to ride with me. <laughs> you know, that we, they're the original ride, ride or die group. Right. You know, so folks were dying every time they were riding. And it, that continues uh, to this day. When we uh, when we look at that Connecticut legislator who said, you know, oh, this idea of black and brown kids feeling belongingness in school is oppressive to white kids, right? And this, mm. this is this is someone who's elected, like there he has support, um, and that, and that's something that probably he won't get, uh, you know, removed from office or anything like that. Like he'll continue, but how how much of this has not been spoken, but is deeply seated in policies and laws and and expectations and so forth. Yeah. And we we are not doing, I think, a very good job of um, of fighting back on any of these things. I think part of it is because we have our heads down and we're just trying to get our kids the best experience. And we've already accepted that the thing is racist and that it, it just is what it is. So saying that anymore isn't the way to go. It isn't like a strategy for success. It's surviving it. And I think, you know, even Sharif, as you and I are talking about this this morning, we are partially talking about how our kids are surviving this arrangement. Mm -hmm. But we're not really talking about how parents are surviving it, too, because in the back of our minds, we know we're making some trade offs. Yeah, we have some worries. We know that when we put them in one of these schools where we know they're going to face all kinds of micro and macro aggressions, mm -hmm. we know we're making that trade off. Yeah, right. But nope. it's not like we feel like we have a lot of options. What's the other option? To go to hood schools where nobody can read? Is that the option? Is that like, is there a middle ground somewhere? Are there these citadels of black excellence where we can send our kids where all the teachers have the fire in their belly and the, the, the love in their heart and uh, are teaching a curriculum that affirms rather than tears down the heritage and the cultures of our kids? Show me those schools and I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So few, so few. Yeah, right. so and I, few. I think those, uh, you know, and what you described, you know, for for families, you know, and like the angst of like I'm sending you here, and and you're doing it before you can even have conversations with your child, right? That kid going to kindergarten, first grade, or whatever, and you're in a place like Lower Marion, right? And basically, this is a little dated, but 2016, Lower Marion had the fifth highest per capita income in the country with a population mm -hmm. of 50,000 or more. Fifth mm -hmm. highest per capita income and 12th highest median household income, right? So we're talking about like like super, you know, wealthy space and every, you know, these kind of uh, pockets are all over the country. And so you get there, you're like, hey, well, I want to, you know, there's violence here in this neighborhood I grew up in. So, hey, I'm going to move here or this or the school is better and it's, it's pristine, it's Tony, suburb, all this stuff. And yet, you're in the back of your mind. What's the racial stress of knowing, like, man, my kid is going to go through this? Mm -hmm. And then, what's those? What are those conversations? You know, when we had Hillary Beard 
uh, last year on the Eight Black Hands, one of the things she talked about was working with families who were going through this. You know, um, she co-authored a, a, a book um, that describes the experiences of, of a couple of young Black boys um, in private schools and what their experiences were like. But she also talked about, you know, th from that book, she's just been doing workshops and working with families who are, you know, dealing with this, as you said, these trade-offs and the, the emotional and racial stress of putting your child in mental harm's way, um, maybe physical, but but certainly mental, where they may get their hair cut because they look a certain way, or they may just constantly have these disparaging comments made about them and to them, uh, what the expectations are. Katira Moore, Dr. Katira Moore spoke about this last week with her, um, or a couple weeks ago with her daughter, uh, being told like, oh, you can't do math. Placing, taking the test and placing into a rigorous math course only to be met by the teacher, like, you don't belong here. Like in 2021, like this isn't old stuff. They were like, oh, that was in the 50s or the 60s. No, this is yesterday. This is today and it's tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but Hillary Beard spoke about kids who actually started having, you know, real frustration towards their families because they were in high school. They said, my family never talked about this, never prepared me for this. And I was going into, you know, like a coliseum of racism is how mm -hmm. they described their school. Like literally being in the pit, wow! And just constantly uh, being in that space, and the family like, oh, well, I, I, I didn't know. And I'm just like, oh, Coliseum wow. of racism. That is, yeah. I you mean, describe man. your school in those type of, of fashions, but that's what it is. That's what it's like for way too many folks. You know, um, I have up uh, one of the the articles that you sent to me to read. Uh, it's called Black At, Behind the Movement to Expose Racism Facing Black Students in Mostly White Schools. People looking for it. It's in Axios, Charlotte. Again, it's an essay called Black At, Behind the Movement to Expose Racism Facing Black Students in Mostly White Schools. If you look at this article, it really is talking about all these Black At um, uh, accounts on, on Instagram and elsewhere where black students are relating their stories of what it was like to go to schools in mostly white spaces. Here's one. I'll never forget the incident that inspired the first real conversation about race between me and my mom. I was five. She just picked me up from ballet class where one of my, one of the other five-year-old ballerinas pointed and laughed at my skin, uh, laughed at me because my skin is in quotes, the color of poop. Um, she goes on to talk about how she never really forgot that. And she never really understood why it was necessary to point her out like that. Here's a picture of her with a little beautiful self with these other little kids that, um, that's supposed to be the Valhalla, the, the end all to be all the integration story or whatnot. Um, in seventh grade, uh, an eighth grade student got on the bus and screamed, Hey, nigga, <laughs> your granddad picked the cotton in my shirt. Seventh grade, right? You think, oh, what's the big deal, Chris? You know, just get over it. Life is hard. Kids see all kinds of bad things to, to people. Now, someone might tell you that. And then there's me, who's a parent, who says if my seventh grader comes home and says that some eighth grade white kid jumped on the bus and said, hey, nigger, your granddad picked the cotton in my shirt. Uh, I'm going to take it a little bit different. I don't know how y'all going to take it or whatnot. That's going to be a problem uh, for me. Um, growing up in a mostly white survey, uh, suburb, I'm sorry, I was seen as a token. Many of my white teachers, almost all of them were white. Uh, my white peers and their white parents saw me as one of the good seeds in a sea of bad apples. So it's not just the microaggressions around um, uh, you are somehow deficient. It could also be the opposite, which is most black people are a problem, but you're a good one. You're one of the good ones. And then you start uh, looking to be stroked that way and petted that way. So you become, for white audiences, the Candace Owens of the white audience. This is where Candace Owens has come from. Uh, besides places of deep and ambition and personal greed, they also come from these situations where they, where they learn how to play to an audience to be one of the good ones the good seeds, but even that has to strike down in you a piece of your, your racial pride uh, in your people because what you're telling yourself is somehow I ended up being one of the good ones, but black is still bad and black people are still uh, bad overall. What a yeah. crazy lesson to learn. Yeah, man. And and the thing about it, this also reminds me, and I put it in our, our private chat on, on this, uh, when there was a few years ago, I remember just all of a sudden my phone started blowing up on on Twitter about 
when I realized I was black, right? And so there were these adults sharing experiences, very much like the young lady um, at ballet uh, described. And they were sharing like, this is when I realized that the anti-blackness and how young that was. And many of the stories were both in school and out of school. But if it's a 360 degree experience, mine is the, the little, you know what I mean? Like where, where can you just be safe, right? Where is all this like, you know, black while driving? Black while walking, black while taking uh, fishing, black while being a f- a f- uh, bird watching. And then that, those are adults. And then you think about the children. Like, when is it just safe? <laughs> like, when, mm-hmm. you know, when you really think about that, um, it's it's nuts. And so this hashtag, realize I was black, was all about, you know, adult sharing. This is when I first uh, recognized uh, this. Um, and then you look at the, the that main line one, um, black main line speaks out or something. I put that in the in the chat too, man. It was just, I mean, you they're just snapshots of all these experiences. And what you see are there are a lot of folks who just get defensive. They don't want to hear. They, you know, the same one side of their mouth they're talking about. We want to hear student voices. It's, a child shares their experiences. They're like, oh, stop complaining. It ain't that bad you know, work harder or whatever, you know, toughen up, whatever it is, right? It's this negative reaction to students sharing their lived experiences. And it's it's crazy, man. And just, when you think about a child from that child's perspective and their peers' perspective, right? Because they, they might think like, all right, maybe it's just me. But then when they're peers, they're like, oh, it's pervasive and help is not on the way. Mm-hmm. And you've left me here. So, I mean, uh, you know, we don't see our kids. I say this uh, oftentimes and when keep saying it, our kids are living existence in the day to day that we know a piece of it, but we don't get all the insights. So they are on this level. They are operating. They're walking through hallways. They're interacting with teachers. Like if you had like one of those cameras on your kid <laughs> where you could see what they're seeing, hearing and experiencing all day long, you yeah. would probably get some insights you don't have right now. Uh, and Which I some folks got themselves. during the online learning of, of uh, they got a piece of it, a piece, a little, they got a piece of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they got a piece of it. And, and uh, specific to black students who are in mostly white schools are schools that um, have a, a white normed um, frame for, for existing. Um, those kids are living and and experiencing things that I'm for sure their parents don't always know about as we're feeling all self-important about, oh my God, I worked hard to get here. And, you know, look at us. We've got the little mortgage and we got our kids in the house and everything, but not your kids experiencing something every day that uh, could be destructive. This, I put up here what you had just talked about, the Mainline Speaks account at Instagram. It's called Black Mainline Speaks. At Esther, if you go, go to Instagram, you'll look it up. It's got 22,000 followers. And it's all these stories of, um, of people, you know, saying what it was like to be Black in different places. And here's one from Agnes Irwin, school alum, 2019, um, a few days after the Unite, Unite the Right rally, a group of students created a group chat titled Cool Kids Club, all spelled with Ks, KKK, and added a number of Jewish, Black, Hispanic, and Muslim students to it, right? And then, you know, you had stories coming out of like students participating in a Snapchat slave auction of all the Black students in their schools. And it was discovered uh, by an adult somewhere. And, you know, the white kids in the school were literally doing a, a trade of a slave auction trade of their black classmates in the school. You can add up those stories. They just keep adding up, adding up, adding up. You can pretend like they don't exist. You can gaslight us and pretend like it's all in our head or we're making too much of things. Um, and you can isolate people who do talk about it and experience it. But like timelines like this, this uh, Black Mainline Speaks is a timeline where those voices won't be marginalized because people get to see, oh, I wasn't the only one or we weren't the only ones or it wasn't just at my school or it wasn't just in my part of the world. This is a common experience. And once you start seeing that there's something that's a common experience that's universally negative, like racism, you can stop allowing yourself to be gaslit by um, by the broader population by more people. Yeah. Uh, Shreve, you know, kind of like this trade-off thing though is important to me in that I think at the end of the day, many black parents are still going to say, I'd rather put them into a microaggression citadel for racism 
if they can survive it and come out the other side with what they need to go to college and get out of college and buy a house and have a job and buy a car and then, you know, live life on somewhat on their own terms versus sending them to many of the schools that are available to us that are the opposite, where they might be more somewhat culturally affirming, somewhat. Um, they might have more people that look like them. They might be served by more people that look like them. But there are far fewer people coming out of those schools who are going to go to college and get a house and then live life on their own terms. What do you think about that trade off? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a very deeply what uh, people are are wrestling with. And I think how I would imagine that a lot of families are how they're thinking about a part of the calculus is what can I supplement? Like, this is going to be their experience. Okay, what can I supplement? If they go here, can I supplement experiences that support their positive racial identity? Um, if you go here, am I going to supplement, the, you know, the academic, the sense of belongingness, right? Because, and mind you, it may be a little bit, uh, you know, uh, more diverse in the, in the others, in the other districts. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be, you know, fully like, you know, mm -hmm. they still you're probably not going to see a black teacher. <laughs> you know, you're not you know, it, it's still unlikely in, in far too many mm -hmm. places. California, half of the districts don't have a single black teacher. Wow. Um, maybe half of the schools in, in Pennsylvania, half of the districts, not a single teacher of color. Right. And so it may be in those, um, you know, you're just. I think just grappling with so much on top of everything else that you know yeah. that families are are working with this is also um something and so when you talk about racial stress it's not just oh this is what i'm experiencing as an adult in my job or with my landlord or with the police or with the political uh apparatus it's also here are my children yeah. oh here are my multiple children <laughs> oh here's my neighbor kids right because we take on the stress of the people we love too right so it's like the community's children and what they're going through and what can we supplement? And this is why, listen, shout out to like, like clear eyed educators in schools who are saying like, no, not under, not in my watch that, that children can find actually a safe Harbor in that Coliseum of hatred that in that, even if it's just in that space, even if they don't teach that person, but they are there, but that also adds to the stress of that, single that lone and lonely teacher of color right because they feel a responsibility they feel like oh i i have to actually protect and serve in a in a way that's act intellectual academic emotional spiritual cultural and i might not even teach that child so not only am i trying to deliver on outcomes for the students that i serve but then also try to be just a beacon of hope for so many mm -hmm. others right and an accountability for my colleagues and supervisors who may just ignore it, right? Like, and so there's, it's just so much. That stuff. part is really important because one of the the students, actually, I think it was more than one in the Black At uh, article said that white teachers and, and any teachers weren't checking each other on their own participation in the microaggressions. Mm -hmm. And in matter of fact, in one case, the kid was like told to, you know, toughen up a little bit or just like, just, you know, they don't mean anything by it. By, you know, just, just like, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. just kids being kids. Uh, you've heard me tell this story here locally. Um, we had a situation with, uh, with Muslim students who were being uh, uh, harassed uh, by students, other students who were chasing them down and rubbing bacon on their head and all that stuff. They thought it was real funny uh, to chase these girls down and, and do that. But the teachers were participating. And when the parents complained to the principals, uh, the parents were told, if you're going to make it in America, you need to really toughen up a little bit. People, don't, this is just playing. They, you know, people don't mean much by it. Uh, in one case, the teachers had handed out air freshener to students to spray on the kids as they walked by, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, um, so care came in and, and, you know, had to do a lot of investigating of this district, but it was a lot of the parents, the principals, the teachers all collectively saying, listen, kids will be kids. Just let them be kids. You know, they, they this is the type of stuff that, you know, don't be so sensitive. So, uh, I see Vicki Redmond here has a quote that just has my hair on fire. She says in junior high school, my homeroom teacher insisted on calling me Victoria. I kept telling her my name is Vicky. She responded, your mom named you Vicky because she couldn't spell Victoria. Damn. When I responded, she called the principal. He called my father, who, by the way, is a black teacher, 
and the superintendent came, they didn't want publicity. Now imagine if her father wasn't a black teacher who came once getting that call, um, she would still be being called Victoria, supposedly because her mom couldn't spell Vicky. Can you imagine the kind of slaps that need to happen in a situation like that? I mean, and that's the thing. Like we all look at these uh, images of Linda Brown and Ruby Bridges and them going through just like outright hostility, terrorism, you know, terrorism um, attached to schools. And for some reason, we think like it all just disappeared just because we don't have those images. There's a veneer that that's placed right on on top of that. And like those, those images prevail. It, it's the the experience prevail. It looks maybe yeah. a little bit differently, not as public, you know, uh, 60 minutes and, and, you know, and Dan rather, they're not, you know, stooped out outside with, you know, paratroopers and all that, but the experience, the psychological yeah. beat down uh, that so many children of color experience in what is supposed to be in a civilized place, a school, you know, a community. Mm-hmm. It's the exact opposite. It ain't a, it ain't a community for them. It, it's literally a minefield, and they're just trying to navigate and graduate and and try to reach their aspirations um, once they get beyond uh, that particular uh, place. But all they're doing is going to another. It's like practice for <laughs> anti blackness in the real world, right? Like that's what school is. It's like, hey, here's your practice. Damn, that's for deep. Anti blackness, and now go out in the real world and see if you can survive. You know, like that's, that's you know, the moment that that black child discovers that that's their situation, they have to start questioning. It has to start a different level of cognition. Wait a second. This idyllic place where I am, the school where all the kids are, where we're supposed to play and have fun for me has this additional thing. I just learned that five minutes ago, right? Like, let's say the moment a kid discovers they have this microaggression that starts shaking the foundation of their place there. They have to then wonder about the people who put them there and like this is kind of fake like you you know this is oh i see now not everything is rainbows and glitter this is you know so that first realization to me has to i think in my mind has to do damage um from that point on i'll make that point the other point i want to make is that you know we have like sister toya mama toya in the in the feed here who would probably be screaming at us to say like listen you know i paid money to put my kids in one of these, you know, Catholic schools thinking that it was going to be all that and it wasn't all that, you know. So uh, not only are you um, you moving, making moves, you're actually it's costing you money to do it only to figure out that it's not all that you thought it was. Let me ask you this about the trade off. Let's keep talking about the trade off. You think maybe it's a okay deal if we put them into schools where we know that the academics are going to be high and strong and college bound academics and that their chances of getting to college and beyond uh, is very high, even though they're going to have all these microaggressions. If we just on the flip side, supplement, I heard you use that word, supplement at home all the stuff they should be getting that affirms them culturally. So doing all the homework on like the second curriculum, like we'll, we're going to make you, so maybe we put you in Jack and Jill so you can be around other people that look like you so that you know that you're beautiful and you don't care when white girls talk about your hair at school because you're in a controlled environment at home with other people that look like you, that have something that are achieving in life. Maybe you uh, put them on a steady diet of black power literature at home. And knowing and, and also equipping them with the skills. Maybe you let them in on the deal. Maybe you say to them, listen, this is a game. This is what we're doing. You're not going to the school to be one of them. You're going to schools uh, to this school to rob them of the thing that they can give you that could be helpful and to let them keep the part that could be hurtful. So that's what we're doing. You know, we're a team. You're a student. I'm your, your parent. We're going to do this as a team. I'm going to tell you that 90% of what they're doing up in there is BS, but you need to get that 10% for life. So how's that for a deal? How about if we just, we, you know, I mean, make the most of it. I mean, I think that's what folks are forced to do. I don't think it's what they optimally would want, right? Like everybody's talking about reimagine, but I, I don't often hear them talking about some of this specifically. And they are, but I'm just saying like, just, you know, specifically, if can we reimagine that whole relationship, that dynamic, that 
that power, that blueprint that they, that parents have to sit at their uh, table with their child to figure all of this out. Um, you know, what, like, what does that, what does that mean? And I also think of like, if you're giving this shield and these tools to a child, it also goes into human growth development. What's their capacity? Like, when do they feel like they are, you know, like just treading water? When do they feel like I'm drowning? When do they actually have to feel like they, I got to put down some of this shield and tools because I want a friend. I'm six. And some of the most important thing for me is to have a friend while I'm in school. Right. And so they they may be more um, vulnerable because they've put down the the tools and shields and armor that their family equipped them with because they're like, you know what, when I have that and I'm vigilant about it, I can't even get a, a hi or a hello and just navigate, just push through. You're not there for friends. You know, you hear that from family. Mm -hmm. but that, that's mm -hmm. way like I mean, it's like it's not consistent with human growth development of most children. There's some children who can like, yeah, I got blind. Like, I don't care about none of this. But when you're talking about like in masses across the spectrum, um, every child is different. But, you know, uh, human nature is is often that they want some type of companionship, some type of, uh, you know, friendship. And, yeah. and so I, I just think it's it's a. Uh, you know, I just think it's really, really hard um, in those uh, circumstances, any circumstance, right? Like it's. Uh, oh, and then, then they become their own little colony within a school. Like they look mm -hmm. for the other people like them. And then you have a white school where you have a handful of black students who have to be each other's, you know, kind of back. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Because some yeah. of those are right. Like you may, you may say like, hey, we're in this together. The other one like, nah, I'm not really like you. Yeah. Like you, you are. You deserve some of this. I'm actually trying That's to. That's true. I'm trying to fit in. And you messing my game up, you know. That's I mean? true. You, you, you do have some young black Republicans. You have some yeah, colorism, like, you know. You have some classism, classism. classism. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, I was here. I've been in private school, you know, for a few years. You know, yeah. my entire experience. You just got here, so you are an outsider. You don't belong here. Yeah. Right? And imagine experiencing that as the new child. I mean, oh man. You know, in in one of the Aren't articles you that you um you sent me an article that. In it, it was talking about how black boys are fetishized in some of these schools, especially if they're athletes mm -hmm. and people are trying to adopt some some proximity to them for their cool. They're like trying mm -hmm. to like live a little bit off of their cool. And it's easier because they're in sports and whatnot. Black women are black uh, youth, women, female girls um, are facing a different uh, experience in those situations even when they're athletes they're not getting the same accolades it's not mm -hmm. cool things like their hair their noses their appearance are always under review and scrutiny by both uh, by not even both by all three by white girls um, who uh, want to uh, otherize them and secondary them like make them like you know you're you're never going to live up to our beauty standard white boys who see them as invisible and have no interest in them whatsoever uh, unless that interest is like in the old Sa Sally Hemings way where things are going to be private and you got a private room and then even black males in those schools looking down on the black females because you know the black males are being fetishized and they want to keep their status and their position it's not cool to be with them I read stuff like that and I just think like that is just such a as, as a father of a daughter too, like the idea that that's what your daughter is experiencing in a school should make you want to move them right away, mm -hmm. like to a place where they're going to be affirmed and they're not going to go through that. I mean, how does that not live with you after adolescence and then your early 20s and so on? It's crazy. Yeah. Um, Brother Gaskins here says, I always wonder what sort of parents would send their child to a racist school like they allowed Ruby to experience. The power of parent engagement and training had little Ruby seeing white folks as broken versus anything being wrong with her. Today, without a home, without that home training and engagement, it's the other way around for our children. Um, and uh, I don't know, Brother Gaskins, I have to say, like, I, I'm with you when I think about the parents that are fighting for integration as the only thing that will save us. And there are so many of those people. I, I just wonder about what kind of self hate it takes. It requires you to be one of those people who think that only uh, breaking up the black peer effect is the way for us to go. And you know, our only salvation is in white schools. I agree with you. I don't understand that part, but I do get the trade off that parents are making when they don't want to send their kids to schools that have very low academic quality 
and so they have to make the trade off to send them to one that has high academic quality necessarily that is not necessarily i should say culturally affirming i get that trade off but then but then it gets complicated even more so right because I remember uh, back in the day, we were talking about like Lower Marion, this super wealthy, fifth, you know, wealthiest, whatever um, in the country, uh, or outer ring. Like literally, it's, it's just a street that, that uh, you know, separates Philly and, and Lower Marion. You saw that, you know, there were many black children who actually achieved better if they were in Philadelphia than if they went to the super wealthy school. Right. And so even if you're there, it doesn't mean that they're going to have high academic. It may be like I see the high academics, but I still don't have access. Right. It's like you're in the mm-hmm. school, but that's walled mm-hmm. off by glass. Right. And so people talk about mm-hmm. glass ceilings, you know, for professionals, there's glass walls uh, for students because they're walking by and they're saying like, well, there's an AP course I'm qualified for. Oh, there's a rigorous math, honors math course I'm qualified for, but I can't get it. So it's not a ceiling for them. It's the wall of the classroom or the classroom door that they can't penetrate. Right. And so it's, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, man. Yeah. It's, that uh, actually too, that, that is a, we don't, we do not talk about that enough. Like within school inequity, even though you got into the school, what you just said, I've seen many times, many times over. You're in the school, and but there's a separate place in that school for you. Uh, Minneapolis, I'm going to call you out. In Southwest, one of my first visits to Southwest High School, which is the wealthier, whiter Southwest Minneapolis High School in the part of town that people want to live in, where you have the lakes and the, the nicer houses or whatnot, that high school, uh, a student actually was my first invitation to come there who said, I want to show you something. And I came to the school and the black kids and the white kids would come through the same front door or one of multiple front doors, but they would go different directions once they got in and all his friends were going the other direction. He had uh, black and Latino friends and they would go the other direction. And there was a hallway in which they would go to that had a second building to it. And it, it smelled like chlorine because the, the pool was right beneath it and over chlorinated and one of the other students said to me yeah this is where they put all the stuff that they don't like the kids of color the gay straight alliance all those type of things a special kind of um um, ethnic clubs or everything were housed in that building where it smelled like (laughs) chlorine and i thought this is in modern times Mm -hmm. this is in modern times in one of the it schools this was the only high school that you went to if you really were one of those parents who either i do this school or i go to private right so even within that school there was a pretty serious uh, separation of the races and segregation. One of the students, when I came back, who gave me a tour, was able to give me a tour because she had been left behind on a field trip she couldn't afford to go on. So her entire class was at a Japanese garden somewhere learning about Japanese flowers, and she didn't have the money to go on the field trip, so she was left behind at the school, which gave her the opportunity to give me a, uh, um, a, a tour. I was a board member at the time, a school board member. So that was kind of a, that was a, that was probably something the principal didn't want to happen. But I thought, wow, look at this. She got in. She was from the north side of Minneapolis, which is the side of Minneapolis that has a lot of um, blight and and economic disinvestment. And she was in this school that was, you know, that that was making it kind of, yeah. And she was left behind. Uh, in one of those situations. Another school that I went to that became a big problem for me and a big issue, uh, a parent had related to me that her daughter related to her, that she had a friend, but she only gets to see her during one period or lunch or something like that, a recess, because she's one of the brown kids and she gets with the brown kids. And um, her parent didn't really understand what that meant until she volunteered at the school. But they had a so-called Spanish immersion school, but what they were doing where they were putting all the Spanish speaking uh, uh, Latinx kids together for the full day. And then for immersion parts, they would bring the white kids in to have some experience with them or whatnot. So they were getting the experience of those kids. And I told the principal, oh, so that's your human petting zoo. Mm-hmm. That's what you've basically created in your school. You, you have the kids here, but you're not integrating them within the school. But that was one of the best schools in the district. Not one of, that was the best school in the district, the one that everybody fought and even bought, got attorneys to get into. So these uh, Latino kids were supposed to be happy that they were there. Just to be there. Yeah. Just to be there, even though they were only there to serve as color commentary for the for the other students. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned earlier, you, you made a point about the, uh, the impact uh, that it has long term, you know, both consciously and and 
what's really scary is the unconscious um, absorption of all of this. And I think that was the whole point of that uh, hashtag realized I was black, you know, uh, initiative. And I, I think about, you know, I can't help but to think about my grandparents. I've shared this so many times, right? Like, you know, six, eight children between paternal, maternal grandparents, and they all uh, were sh- trying to find ways to get to their children into a school. And so they made the calculus, as you said, like, hey, you know what? They're going to be racist and is better than the school across the street. Um, and we'll we'll supplement as much as we can. But I, I remember, look, my mom got kicked out of boarding school, I think in second grade, right? <laughs> you know, um, my, my father talks about his experience and his siblings talk about it, their experience in Catholic school, you know, my mother and, and aunt as well, right? And so it's uh, it's just, it's like, it's never ending. There's no such thing as like, oh, it's it's okay now or this is it. like just the vigilance that's required um is it's it just is unbelievable when you really wrap your mind around like it is it's, it's almost like the uh action talking about mission impossible black child going through school intellectually culturally emotionally safe we don't need a movie we got reality that's mission impossible <laughs> that's, that's it right there yeah, just to get into a school where you can be affirmed yeah um listen this is this is to me all of what we've talked about today to me is a big call out for a um for a apolitical cultural education movement cultural education movement meaning we have to be uh, mindful of getting our kids an education that is mindful of our culture rather than joining teams inside. So what do I mean by that? You and I just had a conversation yesterday uh, with school choice people about how the white school choice movement um, is a little bit adrift in understanding that you can give a hanging person a voucher and that doesn't mean you're going to cut them down from the tree meaning we can get kids out of the mainline racist classist system of education, the public education system, but what's waiting for them after that? Are there all these culturally affirming black private schools that are just waiting for us? Here's your voucher out the pie, out the uh, pan, out the pan and the in fire. the fire, right? You got a voucher though. Right. You got a voucher. And this is where I think they are so short-sighted and they need to, to um, they, well, they need to talk to Jesus just a little bit in that, they 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 give you a voucher which is a ticket out the door but they don't put the the financial infrastructure in place for you to build um your your real freedom your real freedom isn't the voucher that's not even your real freedom that's the door to freedom but it's not the the actual freedom the actual freedom is to own the means of production and education for yourself to build black educational capital and that's not already built so you can get the voucher you can get out of the mainline system but what's waiting for you is there some, there isn't, we already just said that, there isn't some large national network of private schools that are, are affirming of black students that understand uh, the history of black pedagogical interventions that have worked with black students, you know, um, all the way throughout the, pet. that doesn't exist yet. So it's great to put all your money into just changing the law or just getting you a voucher. But if the only thing is waiting for you is a whole bunch of culturally incompetent white private schools, uh, no, thank you. That doesn't, that's not, that's a half plan. That's a half step. That's pulling the knife out from 12 inches to six inches and calling it progress. We're not interested in that. Uh, and on the flip side, though, the, the uh, public school zealots, the people who think that public schools are temples and religious people, you know, about their religious public about these goods. Public schools. Yeah, the, the public goods. goods and all that. Man, y'all are some idiots. But anyways, like, like that group of people, integration. Just instead of trying to get out of the system, why don't we just fight to make it better? Like, like let, I, I've heard that in the last three days from multiple white liberals on Twitter who are saying, I don't disagree that the schools are kind of racist or can be, but I had a great experience in them and they're for all of us and they're for the greater good. So let's just stand together and it make them better. For me. Yeah, work for me. Let's stand together and just make them better for you people. And, and integration will be the thing. We'll just integrate. We'll, we'll integrate white suburban... This, I mean, Nicole Hannah-Jones, again, her and Neil McCluskey. So one's an integrationist for public schools. The other's a private school people. They're arguing online and Twitter about it, and they're both wrong. Because she's like, well, you know, why don't we just, you know, break down the boundaries and send kids to suburban schools and mix all the kids up and whatnot? 
nothing, nothing there either about cultural competence. Just because she ended up at a white school in Iowa where she was amongst all white girls and white people and she feels like that's what made her successful in life and got her to being uh, a MacArthur genius in life. Just because that was the experience she had in Iowa, racist ass Iowa, does not mean that we want to send in mass our kids to culturally incompetent white public schools either, right? So they're both wrong. They both have a problem. Both of them have something I agree with. I agree with good percentage of what Nicole is saying and a good percentage of what Neil is saying. And I both think the fatal flaw in both of their uh, premises is neither one ends up with culturally competent schools made specifically to uh, design specifically to uh, to reverse many centuries of built up science, racial sciences that have marginalized black people specifically, not as people of color or any other thing. The anti nigger machine of the United States actually has not been dismantled. And a good part of that machine is the training of our young people in their early years. And this country, like most uh, parts of the colonial empire, have seen training the young as the first step in creating slaves, period. And none of our schools are looking at erasing that. Not the private ones, not the public ones, not the charters, not the magnets. None of them are taking on that specific problem. They're acting like we're in some post-racial post society, like racism ended at some point, magically anti-blackness ended at some point, and now we could just all choose the same thing. We can act as if the white we're family next door to me, we're on even grounds, and we should all just at this point work together and fix. No, no, that what that would be doing is that would be doing a, a cultural and an intellectual lombotomy on people so that they forget their oppression. And that's what all of this is about. This anti-CRT stuff is about erasing the details of history that would remind us of where we are today and how we got here. The let's just integrate would be a way of letting the good white liberal, the, the white moderate that King talked about off the hook for doing any hard work of actually giving up and sacrificing some things. They'd rather say, instead of giving you a ticket out of the system that works so well for us as middle-class white gentrifiers who vote for Obama, um, instead of giving you some out from that, why don't we just include of you in our gentrifying schools and we'll integrate you in? They'll still be 90 to 80% uh, to, to white, but at least we're letting you in and then we'll break up all that nasty black pathology that you guys have when you're together by bringing you in the white lights at the grace of, of us. You know, um, Man, we're getting a raw deal on all sides. Like this to me is a big right. example of we need something for us, by us. Yeah, this is a this has been a sobering conversation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like man, I mean, but it's it's like you know when you think about it and and like what this actually means, and you know when people have these experiences, like you know, oh, it worked for me. I'm just like I hear what your experience was, and I can tell you my experience was actually about in a school that was the genesis of it was for the success of black children it wasn't the genesis of it wasn't anti-black and they're like hey we're going to change the window curtains and and make it a little less you know uh anti-black or we're going to just you know eat around the edges and and make it you know we used to eat that hot oatmeal all all winter and uh, grits and and uh cream of wheat like eat around the edges, eat around the edges till it cool off. That's what that's what the experience in 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 a lot of these uh, educational spaces is like. Eat around the edges, incremental, plot along. It's okay. Stop being so angry. We are making progress. All of that, and people really need to listen. Um, especially uh, you know the white folks who are in these spaces. Like you need to listen to what Martin said about moderate, um, you know, white folks uh, because you may call yourself that or progressive. Uh, listen to Malcolm of, of his many conversations about the, the liberal white folks um, and what that means and, and the impact and find that and really reflect on when did it actually change in society? Because those things that they warned you of and us of, uh, you know, are still, you know, are still uh, pervasive. And I would say to families, please just keep talking to your children. There's no perfect solution. I wish you could tune in here. We like, hey, do this. Every child is different. Every situation is different. Every circumstance, all of that. Please talk to your children, not just the how was school. Ask them, 
when did you feel the most respected today? When did you feel marginalized? When, when was the time that you cringed? When was the time that you felt proud? When was the time that you felt accepted? Ask questions that have to, you know, kind of help a child process and reveal. So you can get more of that insight of an experience that you are not there, as, as Chris said, like you're not that camera. You're not there. You have no drone. As much as you want a helicopter, you can't drone a child in school. Mm -hmm. And so ask the questions that are go beyond how was your day, you know, how was school, what did you learn? Um, save that for the end. First questions are how are you feeling? When did you feel at your highest level? And what were your low points and why? <laughs> and who? Who helps you feel your best? Who help, Who challenges and supports you? Who makes you feel loved and, and the sense of belonging? Who protected you last week? Mm -hmm. And who did you feel abandoned you and get the child to start thinking about those questions, because some of them, they may not even have the words to describe the oppression that they're experiencing. Hmm. I love that. Um, I think actually parents probing further what you just said uh, and asking better questions is something we're not trained to do. So I think we need to hear that more. Um, having examples of what those questions should be. There's a lot of like, hey, how was your day? Good. Oh, yeah. That's oh, okay. You know, and then that's it. So these deeper questions of probing, no, no, really. Let's talk further about like, uh, let's rate your day. What would you rate it on a one to 10? And well, why? Rate it as a five. What? A five? Where did five points go? Let's talk about this, right? Mm -hmm. That starts a conversation. And what would well, it need to happen to for it to get to an eight? To, like right. what, what would have had Ken, right? Right? Let's yeah. think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yes absolutely, no. absolutely. um uh, um michelle johnson um put in the comments she pulled out one of your quotes uh, there's no perfect solution and i i love simplicity the simple thing i think that we're talking about today is exactly that uh michelle and others there is no perfect solution if your goal is to number one get your kids uh an academic um an academic environment that prepares them for the world and gets them ready to, to be part of the ownership class rather than the owned class. Um, there is no perfect solution for getting there, but there has never been any perfect solution for, for um, people, marginalized people in colonist countries ever. As a matter of fact, all of our ways of freedom have been, all of our roads to freedom have been improvised. So if we are not good improvisers, if we cannot improvise, and that is the reason you have jazz and you have hip hop and you have black culture and you have black style and whatnot, <clears throat> it's almost 90% improvise, uh, improvising, always. Um, and that's what we have to be thinking. I can't speak my own language, I'm creating a new one, right? Like, it's, that's, that's right, mm -hmm. that's right. If there's no way, there's my way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and right now there is no way towards a large opportunity for culturally affirming academically high performing schools for in mass for colonized people in the united states there just isn't let's be real with uh, about that so all roads to our freedom are ones we're going to improvise for ourselves together collectively and as individual families like my 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 route you might not be yours i'm in the exurbs you might want the suburbs you might want an urban situation you might want charter you want might want magnet but we should be uh committed to doing is supporting all of our choices no matter how we make them give each other some grace on why you chose a and i chose b and the second thing i think to do is actually to make them as child-centered as possible because maybe you put one of the, you put your kid in one of those improvised situations and you figure out by listening to them oh yeah this is going to do more damage than good and you pull them out and you move them right like like it can't just be like you figure something out and you stick with it and it's in, spite of, in spite of your kids mm -hmm. like i love where you ended that sharif listen to your children when they say things to you about their experiences at school listen like a like a, a lawyer you know like an attorney and prosecute these schools for their racism um anyways this has been another freedom friday very edifying conversation for me as always. I love these conversations week to week. We need to keep having them. I love the community of people that come and stick yeah. with us. The, the brother Gaskins of the world, the brother Conrads of the world, the sister Johnson and sister uh, Wells and sister Jones and uh, Vicki Redmond. That story that you told today is gonna have my hair on fire for like several days. So I appreciate you dropping that in there. Uh, sister Jones, sister Miller, Thank you all for Mama uh, Toya. Mama Toya, definitely Mama Toya, always uh, who's going to get after me for this particular show, I'm sure, because of her experience of actually paying for a school that was supposed to be all that 
and it turned out not to be all that. So Natalie Hester, thank you guys so much. We'll see you next week on another episode of Freedom Friday. As always, uh, this is Freedom Friday, but you are still not free. But hopefully you're freer after this hour with us uh, than you were when we began. We love you. We appreciate you. And uh, please share this show with